Ah, uh, we've been mute the whole time. Oh, I guess we have to reintroduce ourselves. Oh my God, you missed. Well, we're we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. We just. Oh, I wish somebody had yelled at us. They could. They, I don't think they could. Hi, we just realized we were mute. Okay, sorry. So, my apologies. That's okay. So, the it didn't go out on live stream either, right? No. No, it didn't. Okay, so this is once again, it is Tuesday, March 22nd. This is Senate Government Operations. We're going to be looking at um, a number of issues around or starting a conversation about EMS. We will continue the conversation. It is one of the one of the areas that I think this committee feels very, very strongly about and very supportive of. And so we're going to introduce ourselves and then we'll get started here. I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. I'm Anthony Kalina from Washington County. Brian Collimore from the Rutland District. <laughs> Allison Clarkson, Windsor District. And we will be joined by Senator Ron Hinsdale from the Chittenden District. And um, <clears throat> I, we were wondering why you were all so stony faced while we were introducing ourselves and making really wonderful comments and jokes and you know all kinds of stuff and you were just sitting there so that explains it so. Um, will you are the new Dan Batesy is that it. But that is correct I assumed the responsibilities of the EMS chief uh, about 15 months ago correct. Great. So I think what we're going to do is this is this is pretty informal and we don't have a bill or anything, but I think what we're going to do is start off with Drew. Um, would you like to join us? <coughs> um, we have a, a report from Drew that um, I it, it's a wonderful report. And if you would like to just tell us where we are now with EMS, what's happened in the past, okay. whether we've done anything, whether we need to do anything more. Um, yeah, I guess I left mine at home. Oh, special air. Thanks. Is this going this way, Drew? Yep, uh, everyone's good now, I think. Oh, yeah. okay. So I think that, um, do you need one for the size? No, yes. I just need the digital version. I think okay. you said it yeah. Yeah. a while ago. Okay. You should I'll make sure that's posted. When it was, well, and if not, I'll make sure you get it over. And, and we understand that, um, I mean, Jim Finger is with us and Gwen Zakoff and um, Will Moran and then Haley. And Haley, we understand that uh, the Senator is very interested in this as an issue and how how um, he might and his office might help us with the EMS issue in Vermont. So welcome. So Drew, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Well, first, uh, thank you for uh, bringing up this topic and inviting us to come and speak. It's really exciting to me to be back in the building and seeing actual people. Um, I do appreciate the Zoom invite, uh, but uh, being here in the room and kind of uh, seeing you guys is, is uh, exciting to me. I'm hopeful that, you know, with all the pandemic speech out there, that uh, things continue to improve and we can kind of get back to somewhat uh, normal life. Um, it seems like forever ago that we were here working on EMS issues. Um, it was uh, really pre pandemic that we were talking about, you know, some of the very significant challenges facing EMS. Um, around funding, workforce development, um, access to testing, and uh, education. And we worked on some pretty, um, I think, significant changes in legislation to help address some of the EMS issues. And in fact, that a lot of those um, were enacted um, just as the pandemic was kicking off, yeah. which helped um, you know, delay things, because you know, implementation during a time where the health department and every EMS service in the state was um, overworked. Um, it was tough. Um, nonetheless, we were able to um, take the, the legislative changes, get the rule changes out, and make some what I think is some pretty significant progress in our 
uh, and our challenges for workforce development. Now, I'll kind of get into that and in, in the report here in a minute, but I think it's, um, I think I really want to take a moment to highlight what we've seen already as part of the Vermont Responder Program, it's something that we actually kind of created as part of a discussion in this room. And it was a, a new entry level for EMS providers in the state. Um, that program officially kicked off in February. Uh, we've already managed to enroll hundreds of people um, right. into uh, that new program. So if you guys remember from history, you know, our EMS system in Vermont is made up of about 26, 2,800 people. Uh, we see a pretty significant turnover, 25 plus percent a year. Um, so adding a new level, to, uh, entry level to recruit people into uh, is a huge victory for uh, EMS. Uh, so at a lower cost, certainly at a lower personal commitment to get those people interested in becoming volunteers um, in their communities. I know in our area, um, in, um, in the last 60 days, we've brought on 40 new EMS volunteers in Wyndham County. Um, so I'm certainly calling that a, uh, a victory. With that, we've also been working on um, quality of instruction in Vermont. So as part of the bill that we worked on, uh, there was a, a change for the instructor coordinator levels. So that process took us a while, but we we're officially rolling out the new levels of instructor coordinator in Vermont for EMS, which is going to lead to kind of a, a more consistent educational experience uh, for students in every kind of district um, in Vermont. So all those are really good things. Um, on the other side of that, like every other kind of sector of our workforce, the pandemic had a, a huge effect on us, uh, it took a hit. And we took a first hit on EMS was early when uh, all of our EMS courses that were active um, had to either be shut down or switch to hybrid, which we weren't set up to do. Something of the concept that we had talked about, um, bringing access to people through virtual means, but it was something that our EMS system was not ready for. So we lost a lot of students early on in, our, uh, in the pandemic that couldn't be transitioned over to online education. Um, so the first eight months, um, we had nobody coming into our, our system. We asked for some financial assistance uh, early in the CARES process. Uh, you guys have awarded almost $900,000 for EMS education, which we were able to roll out as grants um, last a year ago, over a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, to stand up our first hybrid education system in Vermont. Um, and to kind of develop that program well we were responding to the public health crisis. I won't tell you it was perfect. Um, it, it was challenging. And certainly it was probably not the best program that we've ever run, uh, but we were able to enroll um, over 300 people into that program in the last few months of the year. And what we really demonstrated by that project was removing the burden of cost. Uh, even in the middle of a pandemic brought us more uh, ability to recruit people into to EMS. Um, and, you know, again, a year and a half later, we're, we're getting better at delivery of hybrid education. Um, you know, we've learned a lot since we started that first program in the fall of uh, 2020. Um, we're able now to kind of run these programs a little bit better. One of the challenges we have is we're back to a point where there's no financial assistance for people and the fully loaded cost of these programs has actually gone up. So we used to be talking about an EMT class that are in about $1,000. Now we're looking at um, in the neighborhood of about $1,500 for the same programs. So good news is we've learned a lot. Um, the not so good news is we still have a significant funding uh, shortfall when it comes to education. So those are the kind of the overview of what we did and what the impact was. Uh, certainly, you know, I think I should speak on behalf of everybody in EMS that it was extremely impactful. Um, what we did as far as funding the education during the pandemic, providing um, for new license level in Vermont. And what we haven't seen the um, results of yet, but I'm confident will be positive, is the support that we've done on the instructor coordinators positions in Vermont for more consistency and access to education. Did you? Do I just have a question? How? Um... I'm just curious, what do you, why has cost gone up? 
fifty percent uh, from a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. What 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 does that reflect? Um, the cost of, of EMS labor in general um, is significantly higher than it was. So, and as well as bringing in um, instructors to do that, um, most of the programs increased their, their delivery costs over the last two years. Uh, there's also a cost for the online platforms that are being used. Um, has increased the cost. You know, the programs traditionally run out of the you know the back room of the firehouse are now more technologically advanced with textbooks and access codes for online um, testing and, um, and all that is added additional cost to the delivery. Um, it's got its pluses and its minuses. Yeah. As you can tell from driving up here, I don't like the online thing. So, mm -hmm. but it, it does certainly have a place in, in the future of, kind of EMS uh, education. Well, if it reduces the cost of it, that's a significant advantage. Uh, the, I think the biggest advantage is increasing the access. I'm so, and increasing access. Yeah. Oh. yeah, as as difficult or as far as we like to travel, you know, I live in, in an area where I have to drive an hour to get to the grocery store. Um, so if if we can limit the amount of time people have to travel and get that continuing education to access that, um, I think we're going to have more people willing to kind of make that time commitment. So I'm, you're probably going to get to it, but I want to make sure that people understand a very tiny little thing that we did that made an impact on you with DFR. So that, and I'm glad you brought that up. Is it was it's not in this report, and I probably would have you know spaced it. Hello, hi. Under, sorry, um, so you made a, a change, and it was actually now three years ago where uh, DFR was to accept the complaints of EMS because we have a, a legislation in Vermont that requires insurance companies to pay ambulance services directly. Unfortunately, uh, when they wouldn't do that, we had no leverage in order to you know, get them to do that. Before I got last fall through DFR um, on their enforcement of that, which is, a, again, a piece of legislation we passed, um, there was a handful of cases, I believe it was six, I'd have to don't quote me on that, but I'd like to look at the report, um, where complaints were made to DFR DFR investigated those, and in all cases, the providers were paid directly. So that piece of legislation did um, kind of to, uh, to correct that trend that we were seeing, which was uh, insurance companies paying patients and not the provider directly. Yeah. Um, and again, that little change um, seemed to have tweaked it, and we haven't seen nearly the numbers of uh, services reporting direct payments to patients since then. And being that that's an ongoing uh, reporting, I would assume that you know, as those reports come out, we'll see that uh, insurance companies will stop that behavior based on their getting told. And I just wanted to point that out because I think sometimes we think about big things that we do and big changes, and sometimes these smaller changes that don't ever get any <clears throat> any airtime at all do make some differences. Yeah. Oh, I'll make the most. Well, I'm excited. I've been sitting in this community room off and on now for quite a few years and to see, you know, some what I think is really significant progress um, with EMS related issues is exciting, uh, especially considering that we had a you know, global pandemic for two years that really set, set us back. Um, so some highlights from the report um, that I think are, are important to note, um, Vermont is still um, we're in the state of a pandemic. Your EMS system in Vermont is still responding to a pandemic. Uh, whether everybody knows it or not, um, EMS played a huge role in the public health emergency. Everything from uh, transportation of patients that were infected to, to um, other alternative housing sites so that they would not infect um, you know, people that are living with or homeless shelters to a massive um, uh, vaccination campaign. Mass vaccine across the state was done by uh, EMS as well as home deliveries. Uh, we're talking about tens of thousands of people that are, are uh, in their houses that would have not had access to vaccination if it wasn't for the EMS efforts going out. I just wondering, were you were federal patients helpful for you folks? Did, in other words, did you end up doing it on your, your own account to figure out your reimbursement? What you did? So, good question. This actually was funded through. Um, FEMA, so that's some of the federal funds the state uh, created a program, enrolled EMS providers from all over the state. Um, and again, it's, it's a good 
indication of the capacity of your EMS system when it's actually funded. Um, we were able to stand this entire program up and uh, certainly Will could probably speak to the, the timelines, but we went from no way of delivering uh, vaccines to homebound patients to boots on the ground in every corner of the state uh, within about 14 days. Uh, and that came about because, again, you have a, a, a EMS system that's very capable, especially when it when it's funded uh, in a way that, that's uh, sustainable. And you know, right now there are still EMS um, services that are out providing vaccination. Uh, we're also providing monoclonal antibody treatments. So in areas of the state where the hospitals don't have the capacity to provide the life-saving treatment for COVID, uh, EMS has stepped up and we're actually directly providing treatment services um, in lieu of, of the hospitals. So through the pandemic, lots of stuff has changed. Um, one of the things that's maintained, uh, has been very consistent, is that we're still not getting reimbursed um, for the cost of delivery services, and we're still short on personnel. And that isn't unique to Vermont, that's not unique to any county. Um, nationwide, EMS is struggling. And for a lot of reasons. Um, we recently did, as part of our advisory work, um, some workplace surveys, uh, reached out to the workforce in Vermont, hey, what's really going on? Uh, some of the things that we've identified are um, EMS is the lowest paid health care profession you can be in. So paramedics for the last two years have been working side by side with nurses and doctors in emergency rooms and ICUs, and in fact, standalone infusion clinics. Uh, and they're getting paid at half or less the wage of the same qualification of the provider that's working you know, next to that. Um, I will say wages have been driven up significantly in Vermont, which has made the EMS financial outlook um, less sustainable than it was two years ago. Uh, we are in crisis um, and we are in more trouble now coming out of the pandemic than we were going into the pandemic because reimbursement rates have not increased the cost of delivery has significantly increased. Um, all of our Vermont ambulance services survived the pandemic. So everybody's kind of holding on. Everybody's, you know, kind of been able to buckle down and keep their trucks on the road. Uh, what we have seen is that the stress is higher. And we're seeing the stress is higher because hospitals don't have personnel. So for those services that are going to hospital to hospital, uh, doing those transfers. So for example, in our area, we have critical access hospitals. They don't provide care for cardiac. They don't provide major trauma care. Um, those patients have to be transferred to another center. Uh, those centers don't have the staff and the capacity that they once did. So we're transporting patients further and further. So from the Brown Road area, we're traveling to Maine Medical Center. We're traveling to Hartford, Connecticut. We've been uh, all the way out into Western New York. Um, we ended up transporting to six different states uh, quite often calling 12 or 13 different hospitals to try to find an accepting uh, for somebody that's having a critical life threatening emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, so ambulance is being tied up for six, seven, eight hours at a time to move patients all over New England because, of, and you'll hear this, you know, from the, the hospitals, from the nurses, the spillover effect on that from the EMS is more stress to an already stressed uh, EMS system. In fact, one of the challenges that we're facing right now is the ability to get those patients moved in a timely manner. And I'm sure we'll, we'll, um, we'll talk more about that. So um, I mentioned the fall of 2021, you guys um, infused some money through the CARES Act and our education programs. It was 448 students that we were able to enroll in three months. Again, we're moving that uh, burden of cost. We know Vermont is one help. Um, they just can't afford to. And so we've, we've demonstrated that uh, over and over again. Going out of the pandemic, 2021 also brought us 4.3% increase in call volume. Um, something that you know has an effect on, especially the smaller the volunteer services. We're asking it more and more and more of these people, more of their time, more of their money in order to kind of make this stuff, um, this, this work. I mentioned the education funding that uh, we don't currently have. Um, and what the effect is there. Last year, we had asked for some money for EMS education. Um, you guys approved $500,000. Um, that money ended up going to the Vermont College system. 
Um, unfortunately, only 244,000 of that went to EMS education. Uh, the rest of that might be used in other ways. Um, so I would, I would suggest that we could have done probably some significant workforce development with the you know, quarter of a million dollars that didn't get used for EMS as part of that um, appropriation. Do you remember how the appropriate, how it was written and why we would have allowed that to happen? I mean, was it if there were students or what was, what was, how did we allow that to happen? So what we had asked for last year was very similar to the year before, which would have been a grants program that we ran, like we ran the year before, where the health department issued grants to cover the cost of education. Uh, somehow, and you know, not being here, um, chunk of money that was allotted for EMT and advanced EMT programs um, fell off somewhere in the budgeting process. Um, and the money for VTC uh, got rolled into some sort of other essential workers grant program that was administered by the college. So it wasn't directly tied to. Um, it was specified that it was for paramedic education, um, but it wasn't administered by the health department. And I guess whatever wasn't used from that, they're allowed to then use for something else. Um, so you know, just to, I'm just curious, is that when we were not here? That, yes, and you guys weren't in session. Well, you guys were in session, but not in the building. Right. So who, who, who is it that we should find out about what happened to that money? Is it the Department of Health or is it the BTC? BTC, yeah. BTC. It didn't go through the health department. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> I could go on for the entire afternoon, but I know you're on a tight schedule and you've got a whole bunch more people. So, um, well, remember, this is the first time we're gonna. Yeah. This, this yeah. I think, is an issue that um, Senator Robin said we've been working on this issue for a long time. And, and one of, in my mind, one of the very basic problems that we haven't solved, we keep looking at little ones, is, is that we still somehow. I mean, it might be getting better, but we still somehow consider um, EMS as part of our transportation system, not as our healthcare system. And it really is, it really is part of our healthcare system. And we need to, we need to shift that whole thinking. And I'm not sure exactly how we do that in a, in a meaningful way, but that's um, one of the things that I've concerned about. Maybe that is something we need to do with healthcare. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how we do it. Part of it is a culture thing, I think, the way we think about it, and part of it is um, how the healthcare system itself thinks about it, and then how we reimburse, we reimburse for transports. Right. So we don't reimburse yeah. for all that there. Yeah. So, Senator Clarkson. So, Drew, um, there is a huge workforce development bill coming from the House to the Senate, and Keisha and I both serve on the committee that it'll come to. Uh, I assume you were at the table on that because you weren't. Okay, so. But I am yeah, certain I would that urge you guys will make sure there's EMS money in that bill once it gets to your I would urge you to take a peek at it. I can't I remember the number off the top of my head. It's a committee bill that came out. Oh, I, mean, I don't know what they attached it to, but it's coming out. They, they're still working. There's still pieces that are being worked on, but. It's about to come out of the house. And okay. so I'd love to make sure after this conversation of whatever, you know, some of your specific needs for EMS are addressed in that. So uh, I will look for that. Okay. Good. Great. Right. So thanks. You can stay right there if you'd okay. like, just because um, I don't think you're going to leap out, out of the camera. Out of the, there. So, Jim, do you have anything you'd like to add here? And thanks for joining us again. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I just want to, Drew's very good at explaining all of the issues, but I want to make sure you know that everything he said is correct. Uh, I can go through the list. COVID has been terrible on the EMS workforce. It's increased our costs significantly for pay, paying. Training uh, is not where it should be, the amount of students that are enrolling classes is hurting. This is a long-term problem that needs to be fixed. Our uh, inflation is way up. And of course, everybody knows the fuel costs, everything we do is up. It's not a good picture. And I just wanna make sure we appreciate the help, but 
it's going to take a large effort when you talk about things that are now even being added. That's another subject is, again, dispatch is going to add a whole lot of cost to uh, services, I think, or towns. And you have to understand that the towns are still funding the differences in, in people's cost. The volume of uh, volunteers, of course, is down, but that's, again, putting a strain on the whole workforce because there used to be a lot of volunteers that uh, volunteered their time and had other jobs. And now you have the workforce where it's a lot of volunteer agencies are ending up having some partial or paid personnel, not all. Uh, that then waters down the workforce. And then you have hospitals and other agencies hiring our personnel. The paramedic course, when you go to look at the, the training that was taken away from the funding last year, one of the things we said was that we had to have it more than VTC because VTC is extremely expensive. I know they're trying to work on the program, but we know still again that you can take the paramedic course when you can send them to one of the nearby states for a third or less of the cost. So it, I just don't want to be all negative, but we really do appreciate everything you do. Uh, we appreciate what the federal government's trying to do, but this is a immediate problem that's going to take a long time to fix, I think. But I thank you for the time. Any questions? Thank you. I think I think what I'll do is um, jump to Haley. I know the senator has is very interested in this issue and um, has sent us a note that uh, is willing to work with us on however we can work together to help solve this. And I wondered if you had any insights into what he was thinking or where that might be moving, if you could share with us. Sure. Um, good afternoon, and, and thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Um, as you heard, my name is Haley Paro. I'm Senator Sanders Outreach Director, and I work on a number of issues for the Senator, including first responder issues. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, EMS issues are a big priority of the Senators. And so on behalf of Bernie, I just want to thank you for having this hearing, inviting me here today and uh, really working at all levels of government to make sure we support our first responders. Um, I'd be happy to sort of walk you through um, the work the Senator has done on this issue um, this year and also preview a bill that he's looking to introduce perhaps as early as later this week. Um, so in January, Senator Sanders hosted a town meeting and that was with the US Fire Administrator, Dr. Lori Moore Merrill. And it was a virtual meeting, but it brought together um, the fire administrator and Vermont first responders to discuss some of the challenges and how the federal government uh, could better support them. And what both the Senator and Dr. Moore heard a lot from, from both fire and DMS um, in Vermont was the high cost of equipment and training and that recruitment and retaining both volunteers and paid staff was really at a crisis point. Um, we also know that the staffing shortages are you not, not unique to Vermont. Um, we've heard in an American Ambulance Association survey that turnover among paramedics and EMTs ranges from 20 to 30 percent annually, which then um, equates to 100 percent turnover every four years. And in 2020, nearly one third of the workforce in ambulance services left after just one year. 11 percent left within the first three months. Uh, but we know that despite these staffing shortages, local EMS departments are responding to a huge volume of calls, 2.85 million nationally. Um, and we, we do understand that funding alone uh, will not address all these challenges for both of the fire and EMS side, uh, but it's really been important to the Senator to make sure that we increase federal investments and also improve access to grants. We hear a lot from rural departments um, that they don't have the time or expertise to access the federal funding. Um, so following that initial meeting in January, Senator Sanders introduced legislation that would more than triple the funding for two existing federal programs that do primarily serve fire departments. Uh, one is called the Assistance to Firefighters Grant, um, and that focuses mostly on equipment um, and vehicles. And then there's a Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response Grant for hiring, excuse me, recruiting, hiring, and retaining uh, firefighters. Um, also in the bill was, again, that federal funding piece for technical assistance so that rural departments would have assistance with applying for the money. Um, and, you know, even though these uh, 
challenges are something that both fire and EMS face. What we really learned from the meeting is that if you are an EMS agency, like many in Vermont, that's not affiliated with the fire department, um, and our understanding is that also accounts for 60% of all EMS in the country, um, that you don't have access to that funding. The fire grants only allocate 2% to non-affiliated EMS, and there's only one small grant funded at about $6 million nationally dedicated to EMS. And um, as I mentioned, we're particularly concerned about rural EMS and the low reimbursement rates for Medicare and Medicaid that don't cover the actual cost of service. So Senator Sanders, to address EMS costs and needs, is currently working on legislation. It would create a brand new grant program similar to what we see available for firefighters, but this grant program would be exclusively for EMS and to fund those needs. Um, it's still being finalized, but I can sort of check through a few things that it could uh, be used to fund. Uh, it could be used for hiring personnel, recruiting and retaining volunteers, training and reimbursement uh, for the training, implementation of apprenticeship programs to really grow the workforce, uh, purchasing new equipment, vehicles, medical supplies, supporting the well-being of EMS personnel, improving station facilities, and also establishing community paramedicine and integrated mobile healthcare initiatives, and lastly, improving regional coordination. Um, like the fire bill, it would include funding for technical assistance as well. And it would also um, request two reports. One would look at reimbursement rates, um, since we do know those are major challenges. It would ask uh, the Secretary of the US Department of Health and Human Services to provide Congress with a report that would detail those challenges, the disparities, the inequities, um, and ensure that um, they have a recommendation for action and how we can address that. It would also ask uh, HHS to provide Congress with a report detailing the challenges specific to rural EMS departments and to non-affiliated EMS departments, and again, develop an action plan. Um, so that's uh, what the bill as in its draft form entails. Um, right now, it's probably around $500 million would, would be the um, available funding for grants. And I'm happy to keep this committee um, and the EMS community at large posted on when that's officially introduced and happy to answer any questions. So I, I do have one and I may have misheard you, but I thought one of the um, things that you talked about was the relationship with the EMS to um, rural health, you didn't, rural health centers isn't the word you used, but my concern about that is that in the area where I live and where Drew um, primarily, I mean, a large part of his catchment area, we are, we don't qualify for a federally qualified health center. So we, if, if it's tied to, to the, the FQHCs, we wouldn't benefit. Well, very few communities in Vermont because we have so few FQHCs. Right. Um, I, I will double check, but I don't think there's any tie to federally qualified health centers oh. or any rural health care facilities. Oh, but thank you for that, that helpful flag that that would be problematic for, for many folks in the state. Yeah. yeah, we have very few. I can't remember, but don't be, I mean, isn't that right? Am I, I think we have like three or five. Oh, no, no, no. No, they, they serve about 25% of all Vermonters. I unfortunately don't know the total number around the state. Yeah, but it's not as many as you think, so. Anyway, okay. All right, any questions for Haley? If you actually could send us, um, send to Gail a link to those, um, the firefighter grants and then any um, ongoing information about the, the EMS potential. Certainly, as soon as it's introduced, um, we can send sort of a one page summary and as, uh, the sure. legislative text as well. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. So we hope that you're going to um, stay with us as we continue to have this conversation because I think this is more than a, a one-off conversation. Mm -hmm. we've, we've been having it for a long, long time and have, as Drew said, been kind of slowly plodding our way. We would have been a lot further if we hadn't had oh. a pandemic, but we did. And, um, we're dealing with it, so. Yeah, I'd be happy to stay engaged on behalf of the Senator. We have to, we need to figure out a way of um, increasing the 
the wages for the EMS people because a fear that I have, and maybe this is unrealistic, but is that the hospitals themselves are short, so short staffed. And if they have EMS people um, working alongside their staff, they're gonna scoop them up where they can make more money. And I, I lost 12 in the last two years to hospitals. Yeah. Where we paid for their training and education, got their experience, and then the hospital very overpay at a rate that we, we just can't possibly yeah. achieve. Yeah. So, Will, would you like to weigh in and give us your um, thoughts here on kind of the beginning of this conversation? Yeah, sure. Uh, I will thank the chair and all the members of the committee for the opportunity uh, to speak with you today. You know, and, and in the interest of avoiding overlap, and I think Drew did a really nice job of, of uh, reviewing uh, the highlights of the annual report of the EMS Advisory Committee. I think I want to take my time with you today and specifically focus on what is also a, a, a very much a hot conversation piece, and that is the conversation around regionalized dispatch. And you know, my my intention and 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 ask to speak with you folks today is to really help inform you on how we think about um, what type of 21st century solution we should be seeking when we begin to imagine these alternatives for you know, regionalized dispatch systems and what the future of dispatch systems look like in the state of Vermont. And, you know, really where I would like to start is, is you know, communicating the fact that dispatch centers today are, are different than what you would likely imagine, um, you know, from the 1980s and, and 90s and certainly early 2000s, and that we look at our dispatch centers today as 21st century emergency communications platforms that serve many different purposes and also specific unique groups, right? So first and foremost, you know, uh, emergency communication centers provide the public rapid access to the emergency response system by utilizing things like technology to both receive and process and decide, and then dispatch first responders to ensure that the public receives, you know, timely and time sensitive life-threatening interventions before they arrive at a hospital. You know, and that starts with a system that allows for the efficient call answering and the transfer of essential information between the call taker, the dispatcher, and then ultimately out to the EMS unit, whether it's a first response or a transport ambulance. You know, modern 21st century dispatch systems include, you know, functionality such as priority dispatching that improves both public and EMS practitioner safety by balancing both the use of lights and sirens against the need to deliver time-sensitive pre-hospital emergency care. You know, there's a lot of research out there that points to the fact that we, we as, a, as an industry overutilize lights and sirens and unnecessarily put the public at risk uh, and our EMS practitioners at risk. And modern dispatch, center, modern dispatch centers utilize priority dispatching um, to assign a level of priority that communicates the responding unit the degree of emphasis on their response and whether or not it's appropriate to use lights and sirens and or it would be um, you know, uh, uh, just as appropriate to go with the flow of traffic and therefore reduce the risk for both the public and the first responders uh, in, their, uh, in their response unit. So a modern 21st century emergency communication center also utilizes and, and offers centralized coordination and monitoring of precious limited EMS resources across the system. You know, these systems utilize technology such as computer-aided dispatching to efficiently deploy and manage those resources to meet both the demands of the 911 system and our interfacility transfer system that, you know, and, and with the goals of really maximizing efficiency and improving health outcomes. You know, so utilizing technology that exists today you know, these systems both track and, and identify the closest appropriate units based on the calculated location of the emergency response call, and then identifies that information automatically for the dispatcher so they can rapidly identify, select, and dispatch the closest appropriate unit. You know, modern 21st century dispatch systems, you know, also um, not only support the 911 system, but as I alluded to, they support the interfacility transfer system, right? So this is this is the those EMS resources that are utilized 
primarily by hospitals to facilitate the movement of patients between facilities. You know, sometimes that's to take a patient from a tertiary care center to a long-term care facility, but oftentimes, you know, it's, it's the movement of a patient from a, uh, from a remote hospital uh, to a, you know, a, a, a specialized care center that, for example, has a catheterization lab. And that's both, you know, that, that, that is time sensitive treatment um, that that patient needs and that they experience a positive health outcome. And one of the things that, you know, that we saw during COVID was that, you know, we had an EMS system that was under a tremendous level of stress. And, you know, not every organization was, was able to operate at the level of efficiency or capacity that they otherwise would have been able to pre-pandemic. So those resources that were utilized to move patients between facilities were limited. And what really became apparent as these types of stresses boiled up through the system and were communicated back to us by our healthcare partners was that we do not have a coordinated dispatch system that has eyes on the state and is able to both identify and uh, manage those resources in such a way that we can effectively you know, uh, keep ambulances moving and doing so with patients in the back to connect them to the resources and to get them to where they need to be. And that, you know, the, the, the inter-facility transfer system really operates in a silo in that, you know, we have 20, around 26 services statewide that provide IFT transportation. And most of those organizations operate in a communication silo. And without that centralized dispatch or that regionalized dispatch system, you know, we don't have eyes on uh, and the ability to sort of identify and track all of our resources to therefore maximize efficiency and, you know, move patients within the system in a timely, you know, in a, in a timely manner. The other thing I would mention is that you new know, 21st century communication systems also serve the EMS practitioners themselves by transferring vital information electronically between the dispatch center and the first response unit, right? So when we do that, so you know, many of you have likely seen the inside of a police car. And one of the things you would know is there's oftentimes a computer, you know, sort of sitting between the driver's seat and the front passenger seat, right? Those are commonly referred to as, as, as a mobile data terminal. And there's a transfer, you know, in real time of vital information that, that law enforcement officers depend on. You know, our dispatch systems for fire and EMS, for the most part, that technology is largely absent. And the transfer of communication is primarily done using voice, right? So the dispatcher communicating directly to the person who's answering the radio on the other end. And so when we talk about things like, you know, uh, really adverse work conditions for our, for our dispatchers, that's one of the reasons why, right? Because every time that data is transferred, that's a touch point. That's a position where, that, that's a point in time where a dispatcher has to pick up a radio mic and directly communicate that information as compared to other near peer modern communication centers that utilize the technology to transfer that information seamlessly and allows that information in that real time data link to always be accessible over the duration of the call. And it's not just the emergency at hand, it's the other, uh, the other emergencies that may have occurred at that location previously. You know, for example, we, you know, sometimes uh, our EMS practitioners and teams will respond to, you know, either a home or a location um, where there are unique security concerns specific for our first responders. You know, for the majority of our, of, of our EMS services across the state today, you know, we don't have systems in place that allow for that information to be flagged and then visually represented for the responding crew so that they're aware of that information. And unless there's a verbal transfer of that information, those crews go without and may inadvertently find themselves in a situation where had they had that information available to them, um, they would have avoided an unnecessary level of risk. You know, so when we talk about the transfer of, of, of vital information, you know, we should really be ensuring that our future solutions can do so in a timely and accurate way. It improves provider situational awareness, it reduces errors, and certainly better balances both dispatcher and EMS practitioner workloads by avoiding unnecessary radio traffic and making the, that type of data electronically available 
um, and displayed for folks to, to review and to flag within their own team um, at a time that makes the most sense during the response. The last thing that I would flag, you know, as, as, as sort of a, a quality that, that we should look for in, this, in these 21st century solutions is a dispatch system that employs technology to improve interoperability, both between dispatch centers and our EMS response units or our fire trucks, whatever it might be, but it's utilizing technology to make these interoperability connections that allows us to both transfer data but to also support other emergency and non-emergency operations. You know, when you look at, uh, you know, more, you know, certainly our, our out-of-state counterparts and our more large and more mature EMS systems, they find ways to integrate all of their critical systems, which allows for the better utilization and reduced workload and therefore more tenable working conditions for both our, you know, for all sorts of first responders, whether you're in the fire service, or you're an EMS practitioner. You know, it's that seamless and automated data transfer systems that both improves our data entry, our efficiency, accuracy, or I'm sorry, accuracy and completeness. So really what I've taken the last few minutes to do is, is to identify, you know, what are those key elements? What are those key attributes that when we look at our near peer counterparts who have modern dispatch systems and they're doing so on a regional basis, these are the types of attributes that we see that, that allow their systems to stand out. And those, you know, that's what I would say, or, or certainly would offer to you that, you know, as we think about the future of, of, of dispatch and, and the future of our emergency communications you know, systems and or platforms across the state of Vermont, it's those types of qualities that we should be asking, you know, whether or not, um, you know, we are, essentially being handed a 21st century solution, um, or is it something contrary to that? And I'll just close by saying a few more things. First is that, you know, I do agree with Commissioner Sherling in that regional dispatch um, should be the future of dispatch across our state. You know, those topics have been studied time and time again over several decades, and uh, more often than not, the conclusion is the same. You know, I do think there is an opportunity for us. You know, we know that there is a significant funding on the table that's been offered to facilitate oh, this sort of jump uh, start. Oh, I, sorry, go ahead. It's okay, but I'm going to um, remind <laughs> you that um, we have kind of made a shift here and we yeah. have all Thursday afternoon that we're talking about dispatch. The, our, our um, I mean, I know that EMS and dispatch are very into connected, but we have not started our discussion yet on dispatch. So I don't want you to get too deep into that because that's the Thursday conversation. My apologies, uh, that, that is my fault. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I've uh, taken up the, the time on, or your time on, uh, on uh, the wrong topic today. So I'm happy to pause there and I'm happy to revisit that on Thursday. Um, and I can speak to any other questions about some of the topics that Drew has raised today. So I have one sure. particular, and I am not sure that what the um, source of this money is, it is, it's money that's meant to go out to the regions, to the MS regions, and my understanding is that there's still $400,000 sitting in the Department of Health that can't be distributed to the regional, dis the regional EMS offices for some bureaucratic snafu. Can you tell us what that is and how we get by that? Because they need that $400,000. Yeah. So, so I think there's, there are a few sort of nuances that are, that are relevant to this conversation. So every year um, we publicize uh, this, we publicize the special fund and what type of expenses that EMS districts can essentially request reimbursement for, for their activities related to things like EMS education, recruitment and attention, those things that are necessary to facilitate the delivery of emergency medical services in their respective districts. You know, when you look at the way the, the statute is written, there's pretty broad discretion on the part of the EMS districts to sort of spend money 
in, in, uh, in creative ways to both support and facilitate the delivery of EMS. Um, so here, here is sort of where the tracks diverge. We have, you know, every EMS district, um, EMS, let me back up and say it this way, EMS districts are not equal. We have some EMS districts that are very, very active and have robust executive boards and participation across, you know, all of the services that make up that district. And then we have EMS districts that are sort of on the opposite end of the scale and have very limited participation and therefore limited capacity to, have, to, uh, to support the infrastructure they need to both submit for reimbursement um, and or even before that, to, you know, uh, act in such a capacity that they're playing a sort of forward-leaning role in the facilitation of the administration of EMS in their district. So, so, so while some EMS districts re uh, request for reimbursement for expenses made, they do so every single year and capitalize on every dollar that's made available to them. That's oh, not the case, as I said, with every EMS district, and some just aren't nearly um, as, as active. So as the years have gone by, and EMS, uh, the, the, uh, this program has been in place for around 12 years, and every year as time has passed, We've had dollars that have gone unallocated because we've had not, we have not had broad participation across the entire state. Many EMS districts leave their money essentially on the table year after year after year. And so that is just one of the reasons why we've seen this pool of money grow and grow and grow and to remain unspent sitting in the count um, and certainly uh, within the Department of Health. So what you're getting at though is how do we take advantage of that, right? How do we get at and, and how do we utilize those unspent dollars? So there is absolutely room for a conversation around that. Um, you know, I, this is certainly not an excuse, but you know, uh, both, my, both me and my staff and almost every single member of, of our division has been committed to uh, the COVID response uh, for, for, for more than two years now. So our capacity to begin to sort of put eyes and brain space on other really important topics has been very limited. You know, as I've said to folks within our EMS advisory committee, um, it is uh, certainly my commitment that we do put the time and effort into working with, uh, you know, our business office within the Department of Health to identify mechanisms that we can take that money and to support various EMS programs that would uh, both help and facilitate the delivery of emergency services across the state. So it is, it's not a straightforward answer. There are several sort of layers to that onion as you peel it back that would explain why that, that, that pool of money has grown over time. But that's, uh, that is the brief answer that I would provide you today. Thank you. I bet we can come up with some ways yeah, of getting really. that money out there pretty quickly. Um, sure. Just put these five little minds together here and we'll come up with it. Uh, so they're big minds when it comes to Drew, I, I'm uh, Drew and then I'm going to run jump to Gwyn here and then um, we have another topic. So just a on the district uh, training funds. One of yeah. the biggest challenges right now are the very deliverables that you need in order to get reimbursed. Um, are not able to be delivered by the areas that need the services the most. So it's reimbursement for classes that you can already offer. And if you have a, if you have an area that can't offer classes because they don't have the capacity, then they can't access the funds to hold the classes that they need in order to. So we've got like a right. so yeah, so we've got like a tail and dog around a circle thing. We can't get the money to the places that actually need it. Uh, and that's kind of part of this reason why this fund continues to grow. Yeah. Well, well, we can. I bet we can figure that out. We can, we can, we can spend four hundred thousand dollars pretty quickly. We know the needs out there, and yeah. we'll just do it. Give us twenty minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to jump to Gwen to see if you have anything to say, and then we're going to jump to another bill here for a few minutes. Hello, committee. Gwen Zaka from Motley Gibbs Cities and Towns. Um, I don't have anything to add. I think um, the um, report from the EMS Advisory Committee. Um, speaks for itself, and um, Jim, Will, and 
and Drew, as always, did a good job of laying out the issues. Um, just as a point of reference, I'm one of the members of that advisory committee, and I'm, I think I might be the only one that doesn't have an EMS background. And um, it's it's a very interesting committee to be on, and, and a lot of hardworking, very smart individuals that um, I, 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 it's one of the few um, study groups or you know committees that I'm on where there is a lot of consensus and a lot of the issues and everyone is sort of singing the same tune. So everything you see in the report is pretty much um, you know, a, a meeting of the minds of a lot of folks. So um, for whatever that's worth, I think that's relatively positive and um, a strong message uh, for the committee to work from. But I'll reserve comment on the dispatching stuff um, for later in the week. Yeah, oh, good, thanks. Thanks, yeah, and we are going to look at dispatch and we're going to look at the money that's being set aside for dispatch both for hardware and for um, setting up the seats and dispatch as it relates to probably kind of all three the ems system the law enforcement and fire and how they relate to each other and how how we do that um on a regional basis so we're that's going to be that's one of those other topics that we don't have a bill for or anything, but I think our input on both of these might be through the appropriations committee. That's so. So um, I think we'll schedule something next week. Except meet with everybody's name. Sure. Yeah. Are there any days that you can't? Okay. So we haven't scheduled anything for next week yet. So that's an odd response from EMS to say there's any days you can't. Like, uh, oh I'm on all day. Thank you. Any day. <laughs> With 315 calls a day. That is true. I, I we saw that. That's we, have, a lot. we have many calls every day. The services in Vermont are very busy. <laughs> yes. You guys keep us on. And I didn't even call when I fell. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. But if you did, the EMS system would have taken good care of you. Yeah, you would have had to get a ski dog. I'm not sure you would have gotten it to her. But. Oh, see, that's a challenge we love. In, in our world, uh, people <laughs> try that every single year. I have um, swam out to islands and picked people up. I've climbed vertical cliffs to get them. You have? Um, I've actually had to spend the entire night on a mountaintop with people because we couldn't get them out. So that challenge is accepted. EMS will get to you in Vermont somehow. Don't right. go falling again. <laughs> you need to test it. The other night he was teaching um, water rescue to our fire department. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Drew. I hope not on the Connecticut Thank River. you, Jim, Haley. Yes. Thanks, thank Jim. Will, will, thank you all. You are not. Okay, now Drew, would you like to dive over for you? Drew, I thought you live in Jamaica, not London Dairy, right? Yes. That's what I thought. I can tell you, you just got moved to. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think I have Drew. You're moving all around. No, you're Jamaica State. Okay, I know on the house side, Kelly's no longer a representative. I guess they moved me on that side. Yeah, I think so. I don't know who represents me now. I know. I'll find them. Maybe you'll run. Maybe. <laughs> well, I don't think they have time. And the pay is not as good as what he's getting now. Are you naming Jonathan? Yes, I am. I'm just choosing one and passing them around. And so do we have Evan? Okay. We have oh, Evan. I saw Evan. Evan, Julio, and Mike Shirley. Okay. Oh my. So she's a pro. I was pulling up your email. That was great. Yeah, that's kind of the quick and dirty version. But, um, are we still on? Do you have any questions? Yeah, yeah. You asked me about Russ. Okay. Evan and Julio and commissioners, thank you for joining us and Ben is here with us. Question came up on the floor. First of all, 
I have to say that I thought that um, Senator Ron Hinsdale did a great job of reporting the bill. You did and, a terrific and, job. And answering the questions. You did. That one that Joe asked was particularly sticky. And I don't have my notes here, but and I, the question was on the Giulio. Um, <laughs> Giglio, Gilio, like Jello. Yeah, J I L L Y O. Okay, on the Giglio letter um, um, database, there was a question in two or three places. It appeared alleged, um, alleged. What did it say? Ben, alleged. Uh, so his concern, Senator White, this is Ben Ovagrosky from the Office of Legislative Council. So Senator Benning's concerns uh, were in regards to what section two of the bill under subsection B, two, three, and five. Um, so the concerns about any past or pending criminal charge brought against the law enforcement officer any allegation of misconduct bearing upon truthfulness, bias, or integrity that is subject of a pending investigation, and then any misconduct finding or pending misconduct allegation that either casts a substantial doubt upon the accuracy of a law enforcement officer as a witness, including testimony that a prosecutor intends to rely on to prove an element of any crime charged, or that might have a significant bearing on the admissibility of prosecution evidence. Yes, and his concern was why would a pending or an alleged violation go into the letter in the report? My right. understanding was from listening to the testimony in here that that was the way it currently reads and that this came from, this language came from, and I got myself all confused here, Rule 15 and Rule 57, and I think that was in even in a different committee. But could can somebody answer us, please, so that Senator Roundhill will be able to answer this on the floor? And what I'm going to do is, um, Keisha, if you understand there, yep. there's that's okay. But um, just so that you know how to answer it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, Evan, can you start off here, maybe, and then Mike, about um, how law enforcement felt about that. Th those are the two questions. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to add. I mean, I don't know if we're counting it, but I was going to ask Ben too. I mean, I did want to try to give some deference to Senator Brock's question about what qualifies as coercive mm -hmm. to a yeah. confession. Oh, right. Gosh. So, so I mean, week. I want to try to honor that. I don't know if <laughs> there's a way. To get a legal standard definition okay. that we can all agree on. Yeah, and I, yeah. I can apply a bit on that one. Okay, great. Okay. okay, so let's do the <laughs> pending and alleged first and then do the coercive. So, Evan? Sure, I, I can certainly uh, I can certainly try and answer the questions pertaining to uh, proposed sections 2370, B2, 3, and 5. Um, so, um, I think one thing to keep in mind when it comes to these sections is that what, what section two tries to do is create a central repository for information that may bear on a law enforcement officer's credibility. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of that information will be admissible in court. That will be dictated under the applicable rules of evidence specifically Vermont Rules of Evidence 608 and 609. So I think that's important to keep in mind because what Section 2 is trying to do is capture the universe of information that might bear on someone's credibility, but it doesn't, but it doesn't mean that a pending criminal charge will necessarily, the court will allow that to be used in court or that a pending, an unresolved allegation of misconduct could be used. Um, but the, the real question is, do we, does the state of Vermont want to have a database like this that prosecutors can tap in order to make sure that they don't run afoul of their discovery obligations and give defendants an opportunity to just ask the court, can I use this um, at any trial or at any hearing to help defend myself? Um, one interesting thing about 
subsection B2, past or pending criminal charges brought against the law enforcement officer. Um, it, it is that that section does stand out a little bit from the other sections because the other ones all have some sort of caveat or, or qualifier built in there that, you know, the misconduct or the alleged misconduct has to reflect on or bear on the law enforcement officer's truthfulness or potential bias. Not all alleged criminal conduct is going to do that. For example, alleging that an officer provided false information to another police officer during an investigation obviously does bear on that first officer's credibility. If a law enforcement officer is alleged to have committed a, a simple assault, especially off duty, that's, that's not necessarily going to bear on someone's truthfulness. So if, if, the, if the point of the question is how might we tighten up some of this language, that, that could potentially be one way to tighten it up. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I, I hope that it does. Yes, I'm gonna leave it up to you. Then. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if we can hear from Julio as well, just because I do think this is somewhat related to federal language. So, I don't know. I want, I want to make sure, like I, I get narrowing it, but I also want to make sure we're honoring sort of the Supreme Court decision that I think promulgated a lot of the language. Sure. I, you know, I think that um, keeping Evan's original point in mind that this is just material that would be available for prosecutors, for prosecutors to make the judgment. I mean, the constitutional standard uh, under Gilio, and that's how it's pronounced, Gilio, um, is that um, the, 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 the center of the judgment comes out of the prosecutor's office because they are the office that knows what testimony they plan to put on, what witnesses they plan to put on, and therefore they are the ones, at least in the first instance, to know how material, uh, that is how relevant, how informative, um, this information about the officer is uh, either uh, casting doubt on their credibility or also uh, casting doubt on the admissibility of other evidence. Um, so that's the point of the database is basically to inform prosecutors and provided that this is really a locked tight database with very limited access. Uh, you know, I think the committee ought to err on uh, inclusiveness. There is a caveat at the beginning of uh, section two, if I could pull it up on this on my screen here, that says potential impeachment information. So potential is one caveat. It doesn't mean it is impeachment information. And then two, it says it may include, doesn't say it must include, um, and it doesn't say it may never include. So, so when I look at a may clause like that, uh, I, and I look at the different criteria that are, or examples that are listed below. My question is like, may it include? Well, it, is it possible or, or to test it? I would say, would we say that it, may, it would never include it? Like there would never be a case where a past or pen, pending criminal charge brought against the law enforcement officer might be impeachable? I don't know that you could say never for number two because <laughs> Impeachment is not just for the truthfulness of the officer generally, um, but it also, um, uh, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be whether they've engaged in an act of dishonesty. An officer who's the detective uh, in an arson case, uh, you know, I would think any prosecutor would want to know that that officer is facing uh, two criminal charges for arson himself, for example. Right. Um, that whether whether or not they actually go to trial or make decisions, um, that's information that I would think state's attorneys or the attorney general's office would want to have. Yeah. Uh, and that's really that's really the purpose of this database is to give a give a full picture so that prosecutors aren't blindsided um, by that information and they can make it make judgments on the case overall. It may be that. Uh, in my, you know, my, in my example, which was an extreme example, but that was the point is that 
you know, would we want to have a statutory exclusion where that information was never available to the prosecutor because um, they, were, they weren't comfortable with the list? Um, so I, I, I guess I would stop there if there are any questions about, about that. I just think that I would like to have the commissioner weigh in also on that because that was also a question about how law enforcement used this uh, database. Well, and how that, that alleged offending. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Committee. Um, the answer to, uh, Mike, for the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of Public Safety, the answer to that question is one we sometimes um, struggle with, not relative to truthfulness, because I, I should preface everything I'm going to say with, if an officer has truthfulness issues, or in the event that uh, there are arson charges pending against someone, um, that those things are typically and should be fatal to an officer's career. So the question of whether they end up on the stand in a case is not something I've encountered in Vermont as a uh, as an issue. If there is a substantive underlying truthfulness issue with an officer or they have criminal charges that are past or present, um, the pending criminal charge um, sometimes gets a little um, muddy in that uh, if someone has a, a an accusation against them and it is a truly contested um, set of facts that um, it, the personnel action, um, they're usually not working, but uh, the nature of the personnel action is usually awaiting the outcome of that criminal case. And not all allegations uh, against any cross-section of the population are, are always true. So I do have concerns about pending things being in the database, but as an as an operational reality, if some if, an, if a police officer has a pending criminal charge, they should not be working. So it shouldn't be, an, they should not be available as a prosecution <laughs> witness under that circumstance. Oh, yeah. I agree. Okay. More, uh, if I may, uh, while I have the floor, Madam Chair, I, I just want to flag for the committee, um, the we are with you in spirit on where you're headed here and believe that uh, a database does make sense, but um, are in kind of a position where, as we're reviewing the text of the bill in detail, have a variety of concerns that things are um, missing or um, not worded as well as they could be or should be in order to actually operationalize this. For I'll give you just a couple of examples in section four. I'm not sure exactly what it's trying to say because the semicolon and the comma are in odd spots, but it, it appears to say that um, a knowing false statement in writing would go into this database, although the semicolon causes that to be called into question, but in writing doesn't really modify the rest of that sentence. Um, so what I, I guess what I'm saying is a knowing false statement, whether in writing or not, should be in the database. And if it's a substantive false statement that isn't in writing, if it's substantive, I believe that should be fatal to an officer's career as well. It doesn't matter whether it's in writing or not. Um, and the second half of number four, I just need to flag for the committee that um, an unlawful search or seizure or an illegally obtained confession does not equate to misconduct in the vast majority of cases. The courts frequently, uh, frequently may be an overstatement, but regularly throw out evidence as a result of procedural um, either errors or new law that the courts are making and deem a search to be not lawful under um, the Fourth Amendment or Article 11 or uh, a confession and not be lawful under the circumstances because custody existed and Miranda was not re read or something along those lines. Those do not necessarily equate to misconduct and as written, um, every piece of evidence that uh, was um, challenged and successfully in an officer's case would end up in this database. Um, and that doesn't make a lot of operational sense. That's the way that the system works. Um, so to create a database with every single hearing where a piece of evidence is lost uh, would be problematic. Um, it would cloud um, 
the issues pretty significantly. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go through every potential flag, but in the accessibility section, or excuse me, in the confidentiality section, this appears to be at odds with um, current public records law. Um, there are instances where these kinds of things are public facing right now. Um, that's not universal. It depends uh, on a variety of circumstances, but um, the way it's written, it would shield them from public view in a more restrictive way than currently exists. So uh, I flag that for you. I think that's problematic in the age of, of trying to be as transparent as possible with, with our operations. And then the last one I'll flag is there are some significant due process concerns here, both on the front end and the back end. How does something actually make its way to the database? It, it's not clear. Uh, the path through the prosecutor. Um, and I think Evan and Leo both mentioned that, that there's a, a, a key prosecutorial um, assessment that has to happen um, to, to sort of assess the, the veracity issues of a piece of information. And so having a process to get these things into the system is important. And we believe it's equally important to have some mechanism for something that has been entered into the system to have a, a way to appeal that. So if, for example, you know, prosecutor Smith decides to put it in, um, if that's the mechanism that's created and the other prosecutors disagree, the agency disagrees, um, there should be a method to appeal the inclusion in the database if we think that someone has made an error in judgment for including it. And none of that is present uh, as drafted. So. Um, really long way of saying um, we're supportive of the concept. We're not trying to slow uh, the process down, but there is a lot of additional work that needs to go into this. And the question for us is, will the House have time uh, to continue to work on it? Or does it make sense to um, ask the Senate to pass out more of a directive, not if to create a database, but to direct the Attorney General's Office, the state's attorneys, DPS, and the council uh, together with stakeholders to deliver a mechanism to implement this on a particular timeline. Um, yeah, Julio, I, I do have to say That's that we're um, a little bit behind my, ourselves here, but so Julio, quickly, do you have a... Yeah, I guess I would react just to the last point about... Uh, point five really has to do with the judicial a judge finding that the officer conducted a, an unlawful search and seizure, it, it, it would strike I, us, I think, as a little anomalous that um, you would, by statute, if you drop that section, what you're saying is that it may not include that finding, and therefore you would deny prosecutors access to that information so that they can make a, a, an informed judgment about whether or to what extent to put the officer on the stand, uh, and maybe in a case where uh, lawfulness of a, a search is contested or is one of the issues, um, and also uh, what information to disclose uh, to the defense. So uh, our, our orientation here is that the purpose of the database is to provide information for prosecutors so they can make the most informed decision. And, and I, I agree fully with the commissioner in that it, 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 uh, finding that uh, evidence uh, is excluded because it wasn't because of some defect in the search warrant or in, in the way it was obtained. Uh, may not necessarily be misconduct, um, but it also may nonetheless be something that would affect uh, the prosecutor's decision making with respect to that officer in this case. Um, so whether the prosecutor styles it as misconduct or not, it, the, I think the aim here is just to provide as full of information as possible. And we're, re we're really talking about a judicial finding. So that's going to be a ruling from a judge um, about the lawfulness uh, of a search. The judges don't make a decision that this was misconduct, just simply that it didn't uh, comply with the Fourth Amendment or, or so, so forth. So that's all I needed to add. So my, my suggestion here is that we answer the um, questions about pending and alleged act violations on the floor that you kind of give that background about the, the, the intent of the mm -hmm. of it and how it would be used and that it is confidential. Mm -hmm. And that the um, 
My guess is that this will go to judiciary in the house, but I'm not entirely sure. But wherever it goes, Senator Ron Hinsdale and I can have a conversation with the chair of that committee yeah. to, to tell them where where we see some of the issues are and how some of the language might need to be tweaked a little bit. To, yeah. Does that make sense, everybody? I, yeah. I know that that isn't an ideal answer. Well, but at this point, I think that's the right. answer where we are with the bill, because we can't reopen the bill at the moment other than, I think, to answer these questions. I think right, right. Fair. In the House, we have, we have a, we don't, a whole cover of a month and a half to solve those particular concerns in the House. Yeah, that's, that, that is my suggestion that we, that we do that. And if it passes the Senate, then it will go to the House and we will have the conversation with the chairs whether it's um, Maxine Grad or Sarah Copeland Ponsis, it would be one of the two of them. And and try and work out, because I, I think that that section, the language around that section is the only place where there was any concern. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then can you work offline with them around coercion? coercion? Sure. Just because we're... Yeah. We're not going to do an amendment with a no, definition of No, no, no. Right? They, I just don't want to take up the time here for them to work offline to yeah, come up like with I said, course. yeah, because we're supposed to be doing the Springfield Charter now. I just said I could look yeah. look into the definition of coercion. Yeah. But we're yeah. sure it's, yeah. I think the fullest picture possible is what I think the database needs to be able to provide. We're talking, we're not talking about the database. No, no, I'm just talking about saying. coercion on that answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, great, thanks. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. All right, so do we have Springfield people here? Oh, uh, we have Walter here and there's Tucker. We were gonna have a we were gonna have a break at 2 30 and I just have to run to get my car. Right okay. Hi Mike. Thank you.